Dishwasher at the uh, dog house. <laughs> Come on down and see Chris on Grunge Night every Wednesday. Yeah, that's right. Every Wednesday night, Grunge Night. Sub Pops Grunge Night. You have to say Sub Pops Grunge Night. You think of Dog House in 20 years ago we'll be doing that? Oh, yeah. Probably doing it right now. <laughs> As we speak over a chili burger. Yeah. Chili dog. I had one of those. I had one of those too. Yeah. Four in the morning, one oh, night. I don't know, I saw Sammy Hagar here about 10 years ago. No, probably even longer than that. I was in seventh grade. Yeah, it's quite a reception. We're going to walk on stage to uh, Sammy Hagar, to uh, Ozzy Osbourne's, because Mama, Mama, I'm coming home. So there's going to be people waving their arms. We're gonna be, we're gonna come down off like clouds and gently land on stage. I don't think we can ever have a stack of things or a Ferrari on stage or something. I have my uh, love Kurt's Plymouth Valiant on stage. <laughs> you, get, you got the brakes fixed on yeah. that, right? It's all ready to go. Every... I got. Oh, you, you owe me 400 bucks. <laughs> Anything needs to be adjusted though. Uh, okay, so that's all that needs to be done on it. Oh, absolutely. I knew it. I was, I was certain of it. I, I bet all the money that I had, and I bet it all, and uh, I won. These, faces? these are the faces of a star. This is where the money is. Just like that guy in Odin. Odin with the buttons. What happens if you don't make it? Well, well I'm going to I'm make gonna it. I'm going to make it. There's no, you know. We haven't even thought that far. <laughs> he's in a hot tub with these girls. Like, I've made it, man, as far as he's concerned. He's playing a guitar, he's like, Ladies and gentlemen, Odin! 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 Uh, 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 he's got uh, coke all over his nose. <laughs> Why was Mr. Bizarre so into Odin? Do you think he knew his mother or something? Pay to play, man. Pay to play. Because he's really supporting him. 
Um, I don't know. We were hoping it wouldn't, actually. It, uh, it's gotten a bit out of hand. You know, we were in Portland yesterday, played with, like, uh, Calamity Jane and, uh, Poison Idea. There was some, like, performance art going on down there, and it's just it's kind of, Portland's kind of a sister city, northwest city with Seattle, and it just seems so much more unadulterated and real. It made me feel good. It made me feel kind of whimsical, too, of what was once in Seattle, now lost forever. Was it really a scene here? Mm, yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, 1987, 88, 89. I mean, 1982, you know. Yeah, I mean, you guys Soundgarden was really cool. Malfunction were really funny. One time I saw Malfunction in Olympia, and there was about 50 people there, and they're all standing in the back watching them, and I pulled up a chair right in front of the stage, and I sat there, and I fell asleep. I fell asleep, and Andy, Andrew Wood was, like, singing to me the whole night and making fun of me and dancing around me, and I felt like a heel when I woke up. Andy Wood was going, she was so that rude. Show. And Andy Wood was going, Olympia! Olympia! <laughs> He was Love God, Landry. Landry the Love God. Landry the Love God. He had white She's face makeup. She's out of fuel, honey. <laughs> Fill her up. She's out. She put that on. Oh, she threw up. Oh, is it, you gotta do this. <laughs> right, is that what you do? Yeah, it's ready. Yeah. Do you really do that? I'm anemic, look at my blood. It's time to burp. Look at those beautiful blue eyes. Yeah, see if you can burp her. <laughs> she's gonna watch this in years to come. Look, she's blushing. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> she's blushing. Look at the little flippers. <laughs> Hi, Francis. This is this whole thing is like culminating like this. Oh yeah, we heard, we heard about it. They asked us to contribute a song to it about a year ago, and we said no. And so you know what they did? Instead, they hired some some cover band and they did one of our songs. No way! Yeah. Anyway, well, we're gonna do one of your songs. Well, we're anyway. gonna do it anyway. So we have no choice but to be a part of the singles family. Is it not on the soundtrack? No, it's not on the soundtrack. It's in the movie. No, it's, in it's in the, the movie. movie. It's just like they just play a few bars of Come As You Are, I think, or one of our songs. At least that's what I heard through the rumor mill. I don't know, you know, I, I've just seen like rock and roll movies like Leaf Garrett and a few years down the road. It's just it's kind of well, you know, ridiculous. apparently everyone that's seen it has pretty much said it's basically just a love story. And it really doesn't, it's just a love story that takes place in Seattle. And it doesn't really have... It's, it's a rock and roll movie with heart. Right. Yeah. It's a Harder documentary. In it. Harder in it? Yeah. Really? It's a Zeppelin song. <laughs> uh, what do you guys think about... Come on, Burpee. Burpee. Weird Al He's weird. He's, that his, he's no relation to Al Yankovic, the famous accordionist from the 40s and 50s. No relation. And he plays accordion too. You know, I can play pretty mean accordion when I want to. Uh, I don't know. It's just funny. <laughs> but you know how a joke is. How many times can you hear a joke? You know. I laughed when I saw it. Man, right. It's nice to be comfortable, not worry about keeping the lights on, or... I mean, that's... We had some pretty rough times in the past, you know. And, yeah, and just, you know, just try to be humble, because this is not going to last forever. You know, a few more years, and take what you can get, and just kind of be a little frugal, and life goes on. Every crumb for himself. I don't think I'm going to be... Yeah, every crumb for himself, that's right. I don't think I'm going to be playing a duet with some mediocre heavy metal band, you know, wearing a wig and... <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, they think it's your performance totally overdriving. I'm like, hey, He's still alive. No, He's still alive. He's still alive. I'm still alive. Hey, I'm still alive. <laughs> hey, 
I bonded with Eddie from Pearl Jam. We broke our little feud, and, and we kissed and made up and danced. We slow danced to Tears in, yeah, Tears in Heaven. Yeah, Tears in Heaven. Oh, sure, it was blown out of proportion, but I've said a few nasty things about him. I mean, I'll admit that. It's in print. It's proof. But um, I just didn't like him, and now that I've seen them perform, I think Eddie's a pretty passionate guy. I still don't really like their music that much, but oh well, you know. Why we'll have an enemy like yeah. Pearl Jam when you can really have the enemy like Guns N' Roses? <laughs> <laughs> the line's drawn. I don't know, those guys were belligerent and it wasn't talk because they were very aggressive and threatening. There was no talk at all. It's like, come on, you said something about my band? Come on, or Axel told Kurt, I'm gonna put you down if he didn't watch his woman. Yeah, he told he told me to keep my woman in line. You know, I couldn't believe it. I, I you know, we were sitting there eating food and uh, Axel walked by and, and Courtney and I just jokingly said, Axel, will you be the the godfather of our child? You know, we're just joking around and uh he turned around and sort of flinging his finger and it's really aggressive and mean, like threatening to beat me up and stuff. And I couldn't help but laugh because I haven't been in that kind of a situation since I was in sixth grade. You know? I couldn't believe it. And, and Duff McKagan wanted to fight me too for something I said and he had about three bodyguards standing around there. And I got close to him and the bodyguards warned me up a little bit, you know, like to stay away. And it's like, <clears throat> we could have talked about anything. You know, I haven't been in a fight since about the sixth grade either. And, and you know, if those guys have some beef with us, you know, they shouldn't, first of all, nobody asks them about anything and they shouldn't go spouting their mouths off on stage in front of 50,000 people. I mean, they had no business doing that. So maybe we gave them a little taste of their own medicine and they just get aggressive. You know, which is really ugly, and that's just a, some primitive human attribute that the world can really do without. Yeah, I mean, this is in the schoolyard, you know, these are supposed to be adults, you know, influencing a lot of people, a lot of kids, listening to Guns N' Roses, listening to Nirvana, you know, and then I think there's a lot more kids act a lot more mature than they do. Sad? Sad happy? I like a Portland band sprinkler song played to Crocodile Cafe. They were really good. Like Tad a lot. Mud Honey. Mud Honey. Awesome. Well, the funny thing is, is that the future of grunge music is now evolving from Palm Springs, California. A band named Caius, K-Y-U-S-S, which is the album of 1992. It's called Blues for the Red Sun, and it cannot be beaten. What's that? Palm, they're from the desert, and I suppose they eat a lot of mushrooms and smoke a lot of pot, and they just rule the world. Yeah. What's so cool about that? I'm saying it's a desert thing. Uh, um, I need to ask you about this. the medicine. What's it like in Well, it's a bit wet. His nipples are really sore. <laughs> Her eyes are really sore. <laughs> it's a wonder. That's right. Uh, no. We'll get some recording done sometime. Yeah, I'm going to try to record by the end of this month, really, or maybe early part of October. We have the material ready. We were sound checking with a lot of it. Kind of got to pick up a few loose ends on a few songs, but pretty much the songs are done, you know. I'm really excited about it. want to make a new record, really absolve ourselves from the whole Nevermind thing and, you know. What about, We're playing uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina on October 30th. And, uh, we're gonna go uh, play a benefit for uh, uh, World War Nazis. <laughs> the Nazi on the run, old folks home, you know. They're getting old and frail, you know. All the gold they looted has kind of been spent away. Uh, what's that? Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Yeah, but there's no Nazis on the run there. See? 
What's new? I don't know. I, I haven't read anything for a long time that I've actually believed in, in interviews because we've had so much experience with, you know, so much crap written about us. It just it doesn't make any sense. Like, that's why I've always chosen to, you know, select what I what I do an interview with, and that's why I don't do interviews very often. It's because I expect to be misquoted. And it happens too often. It's just um, it's been really damaging to us. To tell you the truth, it's, it's really affected my personal life a lot. I mean, the woman in Vanity Fair came into our house with an agenda. She knew exactly what kind of uh, what kind of uh, um, article she was going to write before she even met us before. She knew that she hated Courtney because of the rumors she'd heard, and she believed them and decided to write a crucifixion piece. It's as simple as that. I mean, we've challenged her with um, coming up with the tapes to prove those quotes, and she can't do it. And all the, all the quotes were by inside sources, and no names were made, you know? So it's, it was obviously just a, you know, a crucifixion piece, but... I understand that a lot of people have been really affected by that, you know, they, they believe it. And I'm really surprised, you know, I'm really surprised that so many people would believe that shit. It's just... It's real stigma. It all started with one guy's interpretation of what I was like one night. It started with one interview in BAM magazine and then after that it just spread like wildfire. Just because I chose not to, you know, we chose not to promote this record anymore, not to go on tour for the rest of the year. I mean, we don't need any more press, you know? And, and what press we've had has been pretty damaging, so we decided to lay low, and obviously that was, you know, someone would, would say, that, oh, that's because Kurt's on heroin the whole time. It's just like, I've done drugs in my time, and I don't think anyone should do drugs. I'm not going to promote it, and that's why I've, that's why I've, um, I've, I've never admitted that I did drugs because I don't want anyone to be influenced by it. I think it's stupid. And I think that articles that are written focusing on heroin use in the rock world, is, uh, they're ridiculous because heroin use is no more worse than it was 10 years ago, I swear. And I, I know it isn't. I mean, I've seen it for a long time. It's just, I think that when articles like that are written, that they... They influence kids, whether or not it's negative, it doesn't really matter, you know. It still makes kids think, oh, my rock star hero does heroin, you know, maybe I will someday. I think it's crap. Oops. What? Yeah. And and the the drug dealing in Seattle, I mean the the drug use in Seattle is nothing compared to how they've written about it. I mean, there's one drug dealer in this whole town, you know? Yeah, I read, I read, a, I read something in Rolling Stone how uh, there's invite-only heroin parties and pe people, affluent, successful uh, musicians attend them. You know, I have parties all the time at my house and anybody can come over, can come over, have a few beers, and I go to a lot of parties. I don't know who's throwing these uh, uh, invite-only drug parties. I mean, it's just... <laughs> some kind of hysteria. It's like some speakeasy where, you know, you open the window, like, what band are you in? Uh, you know, whatever. Uh, the grunge rocker heroes. Got any smack? Yeah. Well, come on in. Everybody's all green and... Just, there's goo dripping from the ceilings and shit all over the floor. And, uh, 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 <laughs> it's a sick scene. <laughs> Thank you.